Starting with verse 1, the Bible reads, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more Welches. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. As we take a pause to reflect on mothers, the qualities of mothers, the dynamic of the relationship, we realize that within you exists the same dynamic because male and female are your image. So imprint on us as we study this passage and challenge us with the lesson for today. We ask these things in your name. Let everyone say, amen, amen, amen. So on the third day, just to give you a little bit of the current landscape of Jesus' ministry at this point, Jesus has just come back from his 40-day ordeal in the wilderness battling with the former angel, Lucifer, now known as the adversary whom we call Satan. Preceding, before this 40-day battle royale in the wilderness, Jesus had been declared the beloved son of God at his baptism. It was John the Baptist who said, I am not worthy enough to even lace your sandals. Behold the Lamb of God. You should be baptizing me. And after he baptizes Jesus because of Scripture's need to be fulfilled, the heavens open up and the Holy Spirit breaks over the crowd that was assembled like a dove. And they hear the voice from heaven piercing. This is my beloved. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I am so proud of. I am just over the moon about my boy. Those who were there heard this voice. John says that some heard only thunder because their hearts were not yet receptive to hear. But the Bible tells us that after that, Jesus is ushered into the wilderness for 40 days. I know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, heard about these events if she weren't there herself. It must have been the big buzz. Did you hear what the heavens said about Jesus from Nazareth? I can imagine Mary <clears throat> at this point, <clears throat> excuse me, Mary at this point <clears throat> saying, it's all coming to pass. It's all going to be fulfilled. It's all going down exactly as the angel had prophesied. Now my son is about to be unleashed onto this planet. People are going to know that he truly is the gift from heaven. People are going to know his messianic mission is about to be fulfilled. His kingdom will reign. The heavens will probably sing again like they did the night of his birth. But for 40 days, Jesus disappears. You would think he would want to capitalize on this event of heaven's recognition of his sonship. But no, Jesus goes away for 40 days. And when he comes back, he's famished. His skin broken by the sun. He looks like he hasn't eaten in 40 days, and it's true, he hasn't. I can imagine Mary seeing him saying, baby, where, wh why aren't you taking care of yourself? All of this is going on, and yet here we have a wedding. 
And Jesus, the Bible says, and his disciples are invited to this wedding. Now, before I go any further, I just want to highlight this part that Jesus and his disciples are invited to the wedding. I want to highlight it because Scripture chooses to highlight it, as if it's something we should take note of. Jesus and his disciples were invited. Now, most theologians and commentators believe that Mary and Joseph were related to the bride or groom in some way. And that's why they were there. And this is why Mary takes such an interest in making sure that the guests of this wedding are taken care of, that the beverages are stocked and, and that there's food and everything is to the bride's liking. But the Bible wants to say that Jesus and his disciples were invited. And I, I just want to pause for a moment because any of you who have gone through the process of putting together a wedding, you know it is a process. Even the couple that I married last week in Ireland, they weren't planning initially to be married in Ireland. And, and when we were going through couples counseling, you know, the wedding list eventually came up. You know, this is when you find out who are your real aunties and uncles, right? Once you realize you're paying $70 a head, you can't have fake auntie showing up. And we're trying to figure out, well, who's going to walk me down the aisle? Who's going to be here? Who's going to present? Who's going to be, who's gonna be uh, the person with the first dance? And so on and so forth. And, and families have interesting dynamics and so forth. And so wedding lists are really important. And the couple said, you know what? We're going to do a destination wedding instead because that might be the easiest way to kind of cut some folk off. I'm like, yes, but it's still expensive. So it's a big deal here. Jesus and his disciples are invited. And, and I think it's important to note that Jesus and his disciples are invited before he's really known as a rabbi. Yes, he has picked up some disciples, but this has all happened within the last month. Meaning that the bride and the groom, when they were constructing their list of who they wanted at the wedding, Jesus was included. Before he had ever walked on water, before he had ever called anybody from the grave, before he had healed people of, of, of blindness and given people the ability to use their limbs again after years of paralysis, Jesus was invited to be a part of a wedding. And I just want to say this because I think it's so important for believers. He's invited because Jesus is cool. Jesus is fun. Jesus is nice. He's a joy to be around. There's nobody thinking, hey, you know what, let's invite Jesus because you never know if we're going to run out of Martinelli sparkling apple cider. I, I say that's important because many of us as believers forget that the one attribute about us that should be clear to the whole world of whose disciple we are is how we love one another. Now, that name sometimes can be a little uh, 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 diffused in, in culture. What does love really mean? Does love mean that you have these warm feelings for people? Is love simply a principle? I just want to break it down to something that all of us can understand. From those of us out there who are toddlers to those of us who are celebrating our 70th birthday. Be nice. Be nice. Be nice. Can you do that? Be nice. If, if being loving is too deep and profound and you've never read 1 Corinthians 13, just be nice. This is stuff we learned when we were watching Sesame Street. Be nice. When you're a nice person, nice to the person who is waiting on you, nice to the person who is serving you, nice to the person at the gas station, Nice to the person who cuts you off on the 134. Nice. No matter what the situation is, no matter what the circumstances are, be nice. Nice people get invited to weddings. I know. I, I didn't want to break it to you like that. But when you're not included on a wedding list, most likely... 
they don't want to compromise the party. They don't want to compromise the celebration. And I think this is really critical here because Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, John wants to make sure that we know that Jesus and his friends were invited. Be nice. That's the way my mom used to raise us boys, to be kind, to be sweet. And my mom was always that. My mom was the kind of person that took nice to another level. My mom was the kind of person that when she went into the supermarket, she wouldn't come out for two hours. And I am not even exaggerating. She would leave us in the car and be like, all right, I'm just going to, boys, I'm just going to get a couple little things. I'll be right out. I kid you not, an hour and a half later, we are walking into the grocery store. Mom! Oh, honey, I just, I met the, I met the nicest person. And we just started talking, and we were talking about the Lord. And I tell you, I was telling about my life. My mom has told more people about her life. That's who she was. And I love, even to this day, going to churches and people coming up to me and saying, I know your mom. Your mom, your mom was Teacher Carol. I said, yes. Oh, she was the best. She, she taught my son. She taught my daughter, right? Nice, be nice. You will not meet one person on this planet who has been around my mom and ever said she wasn't nice. Let me tell you how important this is. It's so important that when someone wanted to teach me about a God who loved me and was nice and friendly, I could accept it because I had seen someone like you. It was easier for me to grasp the possibility of unconditional love and grace and compassion and still have boundaries and discipline, but yet still be warm and friendly because I was raised by a person like that. You never want to get to a point where your kids cannot conceptualize a loving God because they've never been around a warm, thoughtful, nice person. When we have caregivers that reflect the character of God, it is easier for us to accept the character of God. You believe that? Amen. What's the lesson? Be nice. All right. Now, what happens next is almost not nice. The Bible says that Mary tells Jesus that they have no more wine. Now, I'm not about to get into the Greek and what this is actually meaning, all right? This is not going to be a message about, is this Napa Valley wine or is this the Garden of Eden wine? I'm not going to get into that because that's not the point of the message, all right? So if you came for that to justify any of your behavior, that's another lesson for another day. But I want you to understand something here. What what Mary is asking of Jesus clearly is more than he can humanly give. And his response, I would encourage all children never to respond this way to your mother. She says, baby, I need some help. We have run out of Sprite. And I need you to help me out. And Jesus turns to her, and kids, don't you ever do this or say this. Jesus turns to her and says, woman, can you imagine? I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even get to the O in woman if I were to dare to say this to my mother. I would have been sent across the kitchen floor. Woman? Why do you involve me? Now, I know it sounds a little bit rude in English, especially in the King James. Some versions try to clean it up by saying, dear woman. (laughs) But believe it or not, this is actually a term of endearment. Woman is what Adam called Eve. Are you hearing me? It's what Adam called Eve. 
It's a precious word. It's a word of respect, a word of admiration. When Jesus calls her woman, he's being affectionate. Doesn't sound right, but because you know Mary doesn't send him across the kitchen floor, you know he's good, right? Why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. So I need you to understand something right now. Jesus does something that he's done before. We at least have it in the, in, in the Gospels when he was 12 years old and his parents were looking for them. Remember, they, they lost him, were looking for three days. They finally found him. And then they said, boy, you drove us crazy looking for you. Why, how could you have done this to us? And Jesus says, didn't you know I was about my father's business? Remember, he pulled what I call the divine card. Jesus didn't do this often with his parents, but we at least have two accounts, maybe three, where he does it. When he told his parents, I'm about my father's business, and Mary's about to say, he your daddy, but she couldn't because she knew who his daddy really was, so she was like, all right, settles it. He played the divine card. I was about my father's business. So he does it again here. My hour has not yet come. What does he mean by that? Anybody know what he means by that? What is he telling his mother? She's asking for him to help her out. He makes it clear that it would require something that goes beyond humanity's effort. And in order for him to help her, he would have to use divinity, and he knows his hour has not yet come. Now, he's already been announced to at least a select group of people that he's the beloved son of God. He's already fought with Satan in the wilderness after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So, so he understands clearly that he is on a mission and his ministry has begun. And he's at a wedding, he's at a party, and his mom is saying, we've run out of beverages, I need you to do something I know that only you can do. And Jesus tells her, it's not my time. What does that mean? It means that it is not the appropriate time for him to exercise his divinity in a setting such as this. It is not yet my hour. My father has not given me permission to perform miracles. Is that clear in the text? It is not yet my hour. Why do you involve me with such trivial matters. You gotta read between the lines. So mama says, son, help me out. And Jesus basically says, mama, please. Really? Really? You ran out of wine. You really want my first miracle to be that I provide more wine for a party. Now, back in the day when he was 12, Mary seemed to back down when Jesus played the divine card when he was 12. But my Bible tells me she does something a little bit different. Verse 5 says, the mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. See, some of y'all don't know what really went down here because some of your mamas didn't act like this. I'm going to tell you what went down. Jesus told his mom very kindly, no. Mary did not break eye contact with her son and was like, oh, no, you didn't. Calls for the servants to come over while she's still looking at Jesus. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. This is a face-off. My heavenly father said no, but my earthly mother said 
Yes. Ooh. Which one should he listen to? This is such a strange interaction. Mom, it is not yet my time. Whatever my son tells you to do, do it. Figure it out, boy. What is Jesus to do here? Honor your father and your mother that your days will be. But what about when mama seems to be going? Wait, mmm. Mmm. What should Jesus do, family? You know what he did. What should he do? Obey who? Woo! Y'all about to get in trouble. All right. Young man said, God. And some of you mothers are like, I know what he did. And he better do it. I brought him into this world? No. <laughs> Who is right in this situation, Mary or Jesus? <laughs> oh, I love this story. You willing to say that God is not right? Who's right in this situation, Mary or Jesus? I'm going to say something to you that will make you rethink why you brought me here. And I wouldn't preach this message in the first year of being here, but I can preach it after my first year. There are times that God in Scripture chooses relationship over being right. There are times in Scripture where God chooses relationship over being right. Now, some of you are going to be like, uh-uh, God is just, he's right. There's, 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 no, there's no maneuvering, there's no wavering. He cannot, be un, he cannot be changed. He changes not. No, no, no. God often in Scripture has changed his mind. God's character has never changed. In other words, God is nice. Right? I can go back as far as the war in heaven. The reason why there's war in heaven is because God is nice. Think about it. Someone having a differing opinion than he and they can actually express this differing opinion and rally up enough support where people believe him over the creator? What kind of God would give somebody a platform to share their lies? A God who puts relationship first. Think about it for a second. Satan comes into God's quarters and says, God, I have an idea. God takes out the gun, shoots him in the head. It's over. You see angels dragging Satan out of the most holy place. And everybody goes, whoa, 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 what happened? Guys, don't worry. I saved you a millennium of suffering. He's about to come with a crazy thought that I knew he was going to act on, and it would have been bloodshed everywhere. I decided in my love and my kindness and compassion to end it right now. Would anybody have worshipped him? You mean, God, if we come up with an idea that it's kind of weird, you, okay. I'm turning back to the heart of worship because <clears throat> it's all about you, God. It's all about you. You would have people worshipping God from a different platform than love, Right? So God allows for war in heaven because he allows for freedom of speech. He allows for independent thought. 
God allows people to speak their mind, and God is a good listener. Even when he knows where it's leading, he can hear them out. Husbands and wives, we could learn a lesson. Parents with children, we could learn a lesson. Hear people out. Well, I know he's wrong. Yes, and he'll eventually find out. But right now, he's convinced that he's not wrong. What are you going to choose? Do you know how many times my son has come up with ideas that I know will fail? But he doesn't know that. He didn't know that at five. He didn't know that at six. He didn't know that at seven. And there's times I understand that right must take precedence, but I'm telling you there are moments, there are times in history and in our relationships in order to have the right relationship, in order to have the right relationship, we need to be able to put relationship before being right. Find some more concrete examples in scriptures. I can. Remember God with Moses? Moses, you talk to Pharaoh. You tell them, let my people go. Moses says no. He says, Moses, I made your mouth. Stop worrying. You'll be just fine. Nope, can't do it. Have my brother Aaron do it. And God acquiesces and lets Aaron speak for Moses, although we don't even have a record of Aaron ever speaking. It doesn't matter. All Moses needed is for God to hear him out. And God says, okay, Moses, I already know you're going to end up speaking anyways, but you know, whatever, Aaron, come on. Even in the same story with Moses between God, God says, you know what? These people are stiff-necked. They're not going to follow me. I know what's going to happen. Let's just end it right now. We'll start over with your seed. Moses says, absolutely not, God. Repent from your anger. Be nice. What would the nation say that you freed your people only to destroy them? Absolutely not, God. If you do not spare these people, then take my name out of the book of life. I am not going. God says, all right, man, we'll do it your way. Doing it Moses' way cost him 38 more years in the wilderness. Moses, at the end of the 38 years, has lost his mind. So much so that God says, brother, we cannot have you go into the promised land. Who was right in that situation? Was God right or was Moses right? God was right, but 38 years prior, Moses would not have trusted it. So God wasn't willing to risk the relationship between he and Moses, so he said, we'll do it your way. It cost Moses at the end the promised land, but the relationship was so strong, he got heaven instead. Amen? What about Abraham? God, you must spare the city. If there's 50 righteous, if there's 40, if there's 30, if there's 20, if there's 10... All Abraham was really wanting to get down to was his family. Will you spare my family? Abraham believed his family was righteous. He says, God, you can't allow the righteous to die with the wicked. Far be it from you. You must do right. If God were to tell him, Lot and his family, trust me, they're not what you think. Abraham wouldn't have believed him. I don't believe it, God. I don't believe it. I don't believe that's my nephew. He's lived with me. I don't believe it. The Bible says that God has to drag Lot and his family out of Sodom against their will. And though they're spared, the descendants from Lot and his daughters become enemies of Israel for generations. Who was right? Who was right? God was. But God chose relationship with Abraham over being right in that moment. We want a king. No, guys, a king will mess you all up. We want a king. God gives in. Who was right? God. But he chose relationship. He chose David. He chose Solomon. The list goes on and on and on. King Hezekiah, give me 12 more years. 12 years you don't need, man. Get your house in order. Please, Lord, give me 12 years. And he cries and he weeps. And God says, I'll give you more time. The more time that King Hezekiah had was not good for Israel nor for Hezekiah. Who was right? God. 
but he chose relationship. In the end, God will be right on every situation and every matter, but he chooses relationship first. Look at the cross. Who was right? Jesus was just, Jesus was pure, he was innocent, he wasn't guilty of any of their charges. He did not deserve to die. He didn't need to go to the cross from a legal standpoint. But he chose to do that for what reason? To be right? He chose to do that for relationship. For many of us, it took a bleeding, broken savior on a cross for us to start listening to him. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1 that through Jesus' death on the cross, everything was reconciled, whether on earth or in heaven. Everything. Think about that for a second. Everything. Everything on heaven and in heaven and everything on earth was reconciled through Jesus' death on the cross. That means there were decisions that were made. Jesus chose the cross because he was choosing relationship over simply being right. If it was just about being right, he would have never gone to the cross because he wasn't guilty. If it was about being right, there would have never been a Lucifer because he knows the end from the beginning. If it's about being right, Moses wouldn't have gotten his way. Abraham wouldn't have gotten his way. You wouldn't have gotten your way. God knows what's best. But we don't trust him. And so he says, all right, you're not ready. I'll wait. I'll wait. God, I'll never deny you. All right, Pete. All right. All right. All right. Let me wash your feet. Eat with me. If this is how God treats his relationship with us, how much more? should we with one another. The old saying goes, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Do you want to be right or do you want to have relationships? I know you're right. I know you know it all. But do you want to be right or do you want that relationship? One day my son is going to come up to me. My daughter has already done it. My son one day is going to come to me. He's going to say, Dad, you, you were right about this. Some of you, it took you 20, 30 years before you could tell your parents that. It was after you had kids and you were about to go crazy. You called up your mom and said, Mama, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be so difficult. And parents won't get that conversation until they're like 40, 45. Some of them, not until they're on their deathbed. But it's okay. Because God is not in it to be right. He's in it for you. That he'll be declared right in the end is secondary to the trusting relationship he is building with you. Whatever my son tells you to do, do it. Mary wasn't being obstinate. In no way. She just knew her son was gonna take care of it. If you take my Costco card and buy enough down, I just know, Hunt, son, I know you well enough to know you'll handle it, you'll do whatever, and I'm sure Jesus picked up his phone, texted his dad, Dad, I know what you said, but mama's giving me the look, and I know God said, you better do what your mama said. Because I'm also in relationship with her. And her opinion and her feelings, they all matter. How many out there want to put relationship first. Sometimes you have to put right first, but that's not what this is about. This right now is about relationships. Children that you want to reconcile with. 
pastor, I, they're living wrong and I know they're wrong and I'm not going to be supportive of all of their decisions. You don't have to support their decisions. You just need to support them as people. But if I support them as a person, that means I'm supporting them. No, it doesn't. You can love people without loving their choices. God put you first. Father God, even in these moments where it is so clear that you're right, that you know what's best, that you're a know-it-all, that you, you come down to our level, you, you condescend to our level. You're willing to, to do whatever it takes to win our trust. And all of your parables and all of these narratives, they're analogous to this incredible, beautiful truth that in order to have the right relationship, we have to put relationship first in many of our situations. Being right will come eventually, but it's not the most important thing in this moment. And we thank you. What you do by putting relationship first helps earn our trust. You're building our trust with you so that we will get to a point one day, Jesus, that all you have to do is just say the word. We don't even need to know the reasons why. We just know you, and that is enough, and we will do as you ask. Thank you for putting us first. We put you first because relationship is what matters. In Jesus' name.